Hey, I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to be taking a look at a hand poser that I've put together for Unity's XR Toolkit. This project is going to let us create custom poses for our interactable objects. We're going to be going over how to use it, the ideas behind it, and we'll be writing the code for the poser used during gameplay. This project has been a long time coming. It isn't the most feature complete thing in the entire world, but hopefully it serves as an example for you to work off of if you want to add additional functionality to. But to get started, you'll find the template project in the description below. And once you open it up, you'll get something that looks like this. Note that I'm using Unity 2019 and device-based tracking. Now, before we even get started, there's a lot going on and I know we're not gonna be going over every single little thing. We're not gonna go over the editor scripts or anything like that. In some of the sort of supporting scripts for the editor itself, I would sort of leave for you to look at it on your own time just to see how it works, but I will be touching on them to sort of try and describe what the overall vision or the overall workings of all of this is. And you may already be thinking, Andrew, it's just a hand poser. How much could there possibly be to it? There's not a ton, but there's still plenty of things to consider. So let's look at how to use it so you can get an idea of that. So if we go into our hierarchy over here, we have a couple of interactable objects. We have our XR rig. We have our geometry for our scene and a sample interactable that we're going to set up now. So let's double click that. And we'll zoom out a bit. And this has already been set up with the XR grab interactable. So it can technically already be picked up. We just need to add the functionality for the hand poser itself. And as we walk through this, I'm going to describe a little bit about each of the components, and then we'll go to look at some of the actual scripts. And then we'll be working on the actual script for changing the pose of the hand while our game is playing. Okay, so let's get started. Let's first go down to add component. And we're just going to add a pose container. And the pose container is a very simple script. All it does is hold this pose object, which is a scriptable object that's going to hold the information for our fingers as well as the offset of the hand itself. But to get started with editing a pose, we'll just hit open pose editor. And you'll notice that this opens up in its own editor window, which I'll be honest, I'm not much of a tools developer. So this was quite a big undertaking for me, but I think it came out pretty well overall. And it's not probably the prettiest thing, but it gets the job done. But if you're familiar with SteamVR, some of this functionality may look familiar to you. One thing that we're going to take note of right now and touch on in a little bit is that we've also created this temporary pose helper object within the hierarchy that's going to hold all of the functionality for kind of the poser itself. Because as you can imagine, I can't just put all of the functionality within the editor window itself. It kind of started off that way, but then it quickly ballooned out of control and I kind of had to come up with some alternative ways of doing it. But let's go ahead and create a new pose. So we'll hit create pose. And you'll see that it's now created a new scriptable object. It's placed it in our pose container here, and it's just put it in the root of our project here. And at this point, if we rotate and we get a better look, we can actually start editing our hand. So we can click on the hand here, we can move it around, and then we can go to each of the joints here on the fingers. And if we click them, we'll get the little rotation gizmo, and we can position them. But we can kind of come through here, and we can edit each of our little fingers here. And then if we want to, we can mirror it from our left to our right hand. So I'm just going to do that. So now all of those changes I just made are going to be on the right hand. And then we're just going to hit save. And believe it or not, that's pretty much it. If we go back to our interactable object here, what our hand is ultimately going to be doing is when it picks up the object, it's going to look for a pose container. And if it has a pose, it's going to use it and apply it to the hand. So that's all it's really doing. But if we go back to our hierarchy here, you'll see that we have these hand clones that we're using to preview the pose that we're working on. And these are going to be instantiated by the pose helper here. It has two scripts on it. It has one that's called the hand manager and another one that's called the selection handler. The hand manager is obviously going to be instantiating the hands and keeping those references so we can either update them as needed or if we want to save the information on them. But one thing I haven't talked about yet is the sort of selection handler. So if we zoom out a little bit here, one of the other things that I wanted to do with this editor window is make it easy to edit multiple objects. So let's say we want to work on one of our other objects. We can just click on it. And if it has a pose container with a pose, it's automatically going to get it and it's going to update the hands. So if you have a bunch of interactable objects that you're just trying to do the poses really quick, this is all fairly simple and easy to do. So if we go and click on our cylinder as well, it's going to get the pose on that and it's going to update the hands. So that's all that selection handler is doing. It's checking to see if we're clicking on an interactable object and if it's different than the one we clicked on previously. And if it has all the information that we need to update the hands. 
And as of right now, we're technically done editing our pose. So let's exit the pose window now. And you'll see that it went ahead and it deleted the pose helper as well as those preview hands. Now the important distinction to make here is that I have both a preview hand and a gameplay hand. And that is because I wanted specifically functionality that's only going to be used when we're dealing with the posing of the hand in editor. I didn't want that to sort of bleed over into gameplay. Because ultimately, if I was running into an issue, I wanted to be able to click on the script that's on the hand and be able to see what relevant functionality is there. It's really difficult to debug when you open up a script and it's like a thousand lines long and it has code for editor stuff and stuff that isn't really relevant to what you're currently doing. So let's look at what the actual gameplay hand is. It's going to be on the XR rig and it's going to be on these hand prefabs here for the right and the left hand. Yours should currently be empty, but this is what it's ultimately going to look like when it's all set up. It's going to have a default pose. It's going to have the roots for all of the fingers. It's going to have the hand type so we know left from right. And it's going to have an interactor that we're going to be listening to for when it selects and deselects an object so we know when we're going to get the pose and when we need to go back to our default pose. But that's about it for the actual rundown. If you want to take a second and look at the scripts in the editor, you're more than welcome to do that. But I'm going to go down to the scripts and I'm going to go over some scripts within our pose here, as well as our hands, just so we can get a better idea of the structure of the code and kind of the, the little inner workings of what makes this all work. So let's go into Visual Studio. And we're specifically going to be looking at the hand info, the pose, the pose container, the base hand, as well as the preview hand because this is the stuff you're primarily going to be working with. For the hand info, all this does is it contains all the info for a pose. So it's going to have the attached position, the attached rotation, the rotations for each of the fingers, and a little function for passing in a preview hand for saving all of the information. Note that this isn't a mono behavior, and it's just going to be a simple data object that we're going to be using in the pose. So let's look at that now. Where we're going to have two objects for that hand info. We're going to have one for our left hand and one for our right hand. So within each little pose scriptable object that we created earlier and it was put in that pose container, we're going to have both of these little containers for all the information we would need for a particular hand. And we just have this simple function called get hand info, where we're going to pass in a hand type. It's just an enum that's going to say, hey, is this the left hand or is this the right hand? And I usually don't use switch statements all that often, but when used in an effective way, it can actually prevent a lot of the sort of duplicate code from ending up all around your project. One thing that I try to do with all of my projects is not try and have code that needs to determine if something is either the left or the right hand. It really shouldn't matter in the grand scheme of things. You should say, this is what I am, I'm going to get this info, and it should ultimately all be applied the same way. But that's about it for the pose, let's look at the pose container. And as you can tell, the pose container is probably going to be one of the most complex scripts in the entire project. I'm just kidding, it just has a reference to the pose, it's actually really simple. Where I don't really think this requires any additional explanation, so let's look at the base hand. And the base hand is going to be the class that our, both our preview hand and our gameplay hand are going to be inheriting from. Where this is going to be holding the information for the pose that our hand is going to default to, the transforms for each of our fingers, which we'll talk about that more once we kind of get all the stuff coded out and we get back into the editor, the actual type of hand this is, as well as the joints that are currently being used at runtime. And all these functions are pretty simple. As you can see here in this collect joints function, all we're really doing is we're going to get all of those transforms for our finger roots and getting all of its children transforms. And as a quick explanation of what the finger roots actually are, instead of just dropping in the entire rig of the hand and getting all of the extra joints that may not be relevant to us, I have a list of each of the fingers where it kind of matters. So. I drop in the transform that's at the root of each finger. So when it gets the component in children, it's only going to get all of the joints that are from the root of the finger to the tip of the finger. So this is when we mirror it and things like that. It doesn't cause any weird stuff. And just another quick example, if we look at this apply pose function, all we're doing is going to pass in the pose that we want to apply to this hand. We're going to be using the current type of the hand to get the info that it needs. And then we're going to be applying the finger rotation as well as the offset. One thing to take note of is that the apply offset does change in between the preview hand and the gameplay hand. And this is because when we click on an object and the hands get childed to it, all we really need to do is set the local position and rotation of the preview hand to get it in the proper space. But obviously we can't really move the hand when it picks up an object during gameplay. We want to move the object instead to where it needs to be. 
So that's what we're going to be covering in just a little bit when we write all that code out. And I guess at this point we should look at the preview hand because that's where it's implemented. <laughs> and here we are within the preview hand where all this has is the functionality for mirroring the joints to position and the rotation, as well as specifically applying its own use of the offset. Because kind of like I said before, it's just going to get the local position of it and set it. And obviously this looks really simple, but you'll kind of see the differences once we get into the gameplay hand. Where I guess we're going to get to the interactive bit at this point. So go ahead and open up the gameplay hand script so we can start writing some actual code. And once you have it open, the first thing that we're going to take note of is that it's going to inherit from that base hand script that we covered previously. And the only extra variable we're going to have within the gameplay hand is a reference to an interactor. And all we're going to be using this for is the events that we can get for when the user picks up and drops an object. So we know when to apply the pose from the object itself and then go back to our default pose. And we'll be doing that in enabled. We're going to be using that reference to the target interactor and we're going to be accessing the on select entered and the on select exited. So we can say, hey, we want you to try to apply the object pose and try to apply the default pose. And then in on disable, we're just going to be removing those listeners. Moving on down to the try apply object pose, all we're going to be doing is from that interactable we're going to be getting from the event, we're just going to say, hey, can you try and get a pose container on this? And if you can, get the pose from it and let's apply it to the hand. And right below that, we're going to be doing something similar, but instead we're just going to call apply default pose. And then getting on down to apply offset, where if you remember for our preview hand, we were just setting the local rotation and position. And since, like I said before, we're not going to be moving the hand, we're going to be moving the attach point instead, we're going to be needing to invert the position and the rotation that we're getting. And we can do that by multiplying our position by negative one and using quaternion.inverse on our rotation. And if our hand wasn't rotating at all, this would practically be all that we would need. But we also have to take into account that the hand is kind of rotating around the object itself. So I have this extra extension function called rotate point around pivot where we're just going to be using our final position, calling that rotate point around pivot function. We're going to be passing in vector 3.0 as our pivot point, and then we're going to be rotating it by the final rotation. And all this is really doing is rotating the pivot point around what would technically be the hand. And since this is a local position, I don't really need to put in the actual position of the hand, I can just put vector 3.0 instead. So what this function actually lets us do is that we can, instead of just positioning the hand, we can also rotate it if we want a more interesting or more complex grip on it. But once we've done that, all we need to do is get the target interactor, get its attached transform and applying the final position and the final rotation to it. And then finally, in this little on validate, if we don't have a target interactor, we're going to try and get one from the parent. And we're doing this because I want to have it visible in the inspector, but I don't want to have to set it up manually. But I also don't really want to hide that it is necessary for the gameplay hand to work properly. All right, so that's actually it for the gameplay hand. Let's go back into Unity so we can talk a little bit about the finger roots a little bit more because that's a little complex. And we'll test this out to make sure it works. All right, so now that we're back in Unity, instead of looking at the hands in the hierarchy here, I think it may be a little bit easier to look at it in the prefabs. So let's go to our prefabs folder, we'll go to our hands, and you'll notice that we have both our preview hands and our left hand prefabs, they're going to be different. And this may be a little bit of a pain to manage if you want to put in different meshes and things like that, but hopefully we can make that a little bit simpler in the future. Um, one thing I would want to note as we're in the prefabs folder, that the editor window does load the pose helper from this resources folder here. So if you move it out of this folder, it's no longer going to work, so don't do that. <laughs> Okay, so let's double click one of these hands and we'll rotate around here. And you'll notice that we have this list of finger roots here, where each of these, if we just click on it, it's just going to be a joint on the rig of the hand itself. And I'm doing this because I don't wanna just throw in the root here because it's also gonna include all of these other joints that aren't necessary for this. And specifically the ones that are around the wrist, once the hand gets flipped, it's gonna flip those as well and it's gonna completely deform the mesh in a way that is not something that we want. So what we need to do is we need to go along each of the little fingers here and let it know we want to use this particular joint and all of its children when we're going to be recording finger information. This should already be set up, but in case you're going to be putting in a new mesh, you're going to need to do this manually. But let's now go back into our scene. 
We'll double check our left and our right hand to make sure that it has the target interactor. If it doesn't, you may need to drag it in there, but it should be set up automatically. And everything looks good. Let's go ahead and let's hit play. And as you can see, we can pick up each of our interactable objects and we're going to get each of the poses that we have for them. And I think that about does it for me in this video. Thank you for watching. If you found this useful or if you have any questions or comments or maybe any suggestions for future improvements, feel free to leave a comment below. I'll also have a link to my Patreon if you find my work useful or helpful in any way. I really appreciate it. But before I go for good, I would like to thank some very specific people on my Patreon. I would like to thank Sven Ati, Pierre Franson, Eric Spatrix, Soul Harvesting, Permerswall, Matt Adamson, John Anthony, Todd Andler, Joel Diaz, Andreas Brillen, Kai Hewlin, Garrison Ball, HTKL, Aya Sadar, Bugen, Sean Oliver, David Drexler, Zoe Oliva, Krabby Tiger, Michael Schubert, and Peter Chow. Alright, now I really think that about does it. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all in the next one.